Uh, so I'm going to focus on the top lines and some of the key findings from the review, which are not necessarily new, but are worth reiterating, I, I believe. Um, <coughs> we should thank a range of people, we already uh, mentioned some of them, um, in particular our peer reviewer Andy Thompson, who is here as part of the panel, Kayla Scott from Involve, who is also here, but then there have been a range of people who helped us to put this together, uh, so they are duly acknowledged in there. And we should say that Ruth has spent quite a bit of time going through databases. Um, and actually, we didn't find as much as we were expecting to find. Because there is a lot of work and there is a lot of evidence on community engagement. And then there is a lot of evidence, a lot of work on equalities or inequalities. But those two literatures don't seem to talk to each other that often. There is less than we were hoping for. Um, Nonetheless, uh, um, Ruth did, uh, after going through the usual systematic process that we go through in an evidence review, she did include 70 sources that met our criteria. We focused on, um, uh, on the post-99 um, uh, uh, timeline, just to, to recognize the key milestones in Scottish history, uh, with devolution and so on. And we focused particularly on Scottish literature, but we did draw as well on literature from the rest of the UK, from Canada, from Australia, from Denmark, and some specific studies that were uh, particularly relevant. There was a range of um, uh, there were a range of methodologies uh, in the review uh, in, in terms of quantitative, qualitative studies, mixed methods, uh, less mixed methods studies that we were that, that we were hoping for. Um, some evidence review reviews and a lot of toolkits. So I'm not, I don't think we are short of toolkits. There are tons out there, as you probably know. And I think we're now more at the stage of um, how do we build on all the good work that has been done and how do we bring to the forefront of this debate one core issue that, in my mind, underpins everything else, which is power. And power inequalities is a fundamental cause, perhaps, of all other inequalities. So I'll come back to this. Um, the literature, literature that uh, Ruth went through covers a number of policy areas, from urban studies to public policy, local governance, social policy, and so on and so forth. Um, and we were asking three key questions. We were asking, how is that relationship between equality and community engagement conceptualized in the literature? How are people thinking about these two key aspects uh, of the broader uh, participatory democracy landscape? Uh, we wanted to also understand what are the key dimensions and factors in that relationship. Um, particularly in terms of the process of engagement itself and the outcomes of the process. And um, disappointingly, it was, quite, uh, it was difficult to find material on uh, the uh, outcomes of community engagement. There is still um, a lack of substantial evidence base to demonstrate the, the power of community engagement that many of us working in this field have seen uh, in practice. But we also need to tell those stories and document them better. So that's one of the lessons uh, we take out of the review. <coughs> and then we were also asking the what works question, which is always a, a tricky one, because it's what works for whom, where, under what conditions, and so on and so forth. Um, but nonetheless, we wanted to see what the literature has to say about strategies and approaches that might take us in the right direction. So the review is a review of what is already out there, and therefore, not many surprises, just a reflection and an overview of some of the stuff that has been published over the last 15-20 um, years. Uh, and we use a number of key terms, we kept the search fairly open and flexible, uh, so we didn't have a very narrow definition of equality. Uh, in some cases equality meant equal treatment, equity, fairness, justice, um, sometimes it was equality of opportunity, sometimes it was equality of outcome. So in the literature, these concepts are fairly fluid, and we uh, just wanted to reflect that rather than create a straight jacket. Uh, and that's how uh, we got to all of the studies that made it through the criteria. And um, obviously, inequality usually serves usual um, understanding of the concept is when a person or group or community is unfairly or negatively impacted due to where they live, their personal characteristics or circumstances, or their lived experience. Uh, then community, as we know, is itself another really complex context, so we kept it very open um, and we think of communities of place, practice and interest, 
uh, and we leave it as broadly as broad as that. It might be communities of place, of geography, it might be communities of identity, LGBT, uh, for example, or communities of interest in uh, women's groups, etc. Uh, then, the hard to reach is, is a label that has been, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that it's beginning to disappear, well, I don't know if it's disappearing, but people are more mindful that it's not as easy as that, and perhaps it's better to talk about... Um, seldom you know, hair. Yeah, seldom hair or easy to ignore, which to me puts the finger on the power issue, mm -hmm. which to me is what this review uh, tries to do. Um, and we looked at... There are two key thematic areas, as you will see in the paper. One is equality of access, and the other one is equality of influence. So I'll, I'll come back to this in a second, but um, equality of access is what it says in the team, you know, the extent to which people get access to community engagement processes. And what we find um, is that very often the inequalities that are so pervasive in our society then um, kind of get translated into practices that determine whether people get access or not. Again, as I said earlier, uh, none of this is new, but perhaps it's disappointing that after decades of working on some of these issues, I see some people in the room that I know have been working on these things for 10, 20, 30 years, uh, it's perhaps disappointing that we're still making similar points to what we could make in the 80s or the 90s. Um, those barriers, um, um, as, as usual, is, is, is to do with practical barriers, resources, transport, childcare. Uh, is to do with personal uh, circumstances and personal sort of um, um, uh, personal capacity to engage, which might have to do with language, co confidence, level of education, and so on and so forth. Uh, socioeconomic barriers. Um, we find that, uh, and again, it's no surprise that. Uh, people who are low earnings, people who might be on the margins of uh, the mainstream of uh, most engagement processes out there um, are systematically excluded even before these processes begin. Just the design of the process itself uh, tends to exclude people by default, by not making a conscious effort to involve those particular groups. And then there are uh, barriers to do with motivation. And this is that vicious circle of participating in engagement processes that are disappointing at best, manipulative at worst, um, and which fits that spiral of cynicism. And this is, this is a really dangerous game because we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of engagement processes every day. So you can see that once that kind of um, spiral of cynicism uh, gets in place, then it's really difficult to rebuild the relationships between citizens, communities, authorities, organizations, and so on. Uh, and then we look at equality in the process. And the reason this is, um, this is one of the aspects that has been that we are less familiar with, because often when we think about equality and engagement, we're thinking about how do we get the right mix of people in the room. But less often we think about, now how do we make sure that everyone who is in the room or in the process has an equal chance of influence in the process? We all will all be familiar with some of the typical rituals in some meetings, dominant voices, the use of jargons and exclusionary dynamic, um, posturing, all, all those sorts of things that happen and that tend to um, uh, uh, um, diminish the influence that some of the people participating may have. Um, so gaining access to community engagement does not warranty influence over the process or the outcome. So we need to care not only about whether we have the right mix in the room, but also whether we have the right design and facilitation so that everyone feels they can influence the outcome of the process. And this is what Iris Marion Young, a political theorist, calls internal inclusion or internal exclusion. Is this idea that uh, it's no longer enough to care about who makes it into the process, we also need to think about what happens within the process in terms of influence and shaping outcomes. Um, and a number of issues um, are brought up by Ruth in the review, having to do with language barriers, as you would expect, sometimes to do with English as a second language, or the use of complex terminology. Um, but also, as well, the influence of well-resourced groups and people who know how to play the game and take advantage of existing engagement processes and how that often can be to the detriment of either minority voices or majority <coughs> voices that just don't find a way of articulating their perspective as forceful, forcefully as those groups. Um, when we looked at, I'm 
going fairly, but hopefully it's enough of a hook so that you can look into the detail. I'm just giving you the sort of headlines. Um, so that was about process. Now, in terms of outcome, um, you know, and, and the extent to which community engagement um, uh, has positive outcomes for those who participate uh, and for those who don't participate but might be nonetheless affected by the issues considered in that process. Um, we did find some evidence to suggest that there are positive but also negative uh, impacts of community engagement. On the positive side, improved health, confidence, um, the development of key skills, cohesion, um, and sometimes um, policies might be uh, improved and made more palatable by involving people in shaping them. So then they might face less resistance. So on the positive side, side those are the kind of things that we found in the literature. On the negative side, the literature talks about pressure, stress, exhaustion. Um, you know, this reminded me when I was going through these findings, it reminded me of the Scottish, uh, the Scottish Attitude Survey a couple of years ago that showed that 7% of the Scottish population volunteered 13 times or more in the last year. So that's 7%. Which to me, that says that a big burden of participation in engagement processes falls in a very small group that are super engaged and committed. Um, while then there is more light touch engagement going on um, by, by others who might not have access or be included or be enabled to participate. Um, so, um, a lot of pressure on those who get engaged. And often, we also found in the literature, the disenchantment and the disappointment that comes from uh, outcomes not reflecting the discussions, the input, the perspectives, and so on, that came through the process. A lack of transparency about the, how the participation um, of different groups is reflected in the decisions that are taken. Um, but we didn't find much evidence on the long-term impacts. There are very few studies um, that actually take a, a long-term view and try to say, you know, in this community there has been there have been engagement processes over 10, 20 years, and these are the outcomes we can um, uh, document over time. It's not just about measuring, it's not just the numbers, it's also the stories. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have a lot of long-term studies. And that, I think, is an indictment on our research system that encourages us to do very short-term research projects, to be honest. There are other issues involved, but that's part of it, surely. Um, now, some of the, and again, I won't go into the detail, but when Ruth was trying, about, was trying to cluster the different themes that came through in the literature in terms of the key factors um, when considering engagement and equality, she came up with these five broad themes, and again, they are explained in detail in the paper. Um, but power sharing is perhaps the most um, salient, in my view, um, because it's very seldom we find processes where it's very, very clear and transparent the level of power sharing that the relevant authority or organization or organizer are prepared to put on the table. And that undermines the process from the outset. If you are not very clear, uh, you, you might be familiar with that spectrum of participation from information to empowerment or the ladder of participation in all those different ways. Um, you know, all, all those different stages um, and, and approaches are legitimate. The problem is when you are, when, when you are um, offering one thing and actually then doing another. So for example, if we think of four key levels, information giving, um, consultation, co-production, and devolution or delegation as four core sort of uh, approaches to power sharing, with information being perhaps the least <coughs> empowering, although there is a key role for it and you giving information is a first step, with consultation being a step in which the organizer still keeps the power to decide over what happens, but there's some level of power sharing in shaping part of the process. With co-production being a more a sort of um, egalitarian, potentially, approach to power sharing by saying we all shape the outcome. And with devolution delegation being uh, perhaps one of the most um, um, empowering sides of the spectrum in the sense that it says whatever you decide will be implemented. Now, there's a role for all those different approaches to engagement, the problem comes when you say we're going to co-produce and all you're doing is consulting. Or when you're um, saying we're going to delegate and devolve power to these 
local partnership, but actually what you're doing is somewhere in between consultation and co-production. It's the expectations game, and, and we find that there is a, a lot of um, lack of transparency in being clear about what is realistic, what is the power that can realistically be shared in this process. And a lot of people who participate and get very cynical about these processes will be much more uh, understanding and um, and perhaps enthused if that transparency was at the forefront of all the processes we organize. Um, then another key theme in the literature was around partnerships. And we know that um, well, I mean, there are hundreds of partnerships, public and third sector, community sector, in some cases private sector. Um, last time, I think last time someone cared to count was in 2006, Helen Sullivan said there are in the UK at least 7,000 um, local partnerships. That's just a local level. Um, I think by now we're probably near 20,000. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and that's because it has become a sort of a, a fashionable thing. Uh, there are good reasons for it. Um, you know, it is um, in, some, in some cases, and there have been cases where collaborative, collaborative advantage, which is the advantage you get by doing things together rather than in separate silos, collaborative advantage can be realized through partnership. But there is also something to be said, and we have a, a What Works in Scotland review on partnership working and partnership outcomes, that there are issues, um, sometimes there are real difficulties in partnerships that are mandated. We have a lot of mandated partnerships rather than organic partnerships that emerge because people want to collaborate. We have a lot of partnerships that emerge because they are imposed in some way, and that uh, causes uh, some challenges. Um, what we found in the literature is that good partnerships are based on trust and reciprocity, in having a sense that I cannot do what I need to do unless I collaborate with you. If you have that sense of interdependence, then partnerships tend to work. If you don't have that sense of interdependence, partnerships can be a place for ritualized engagement that might be productive or not, depending on the people involved. Um, then representation. This is a thing that has to do with this notion that there are some people out there who can represent their community, whether that's a community of place, practice, or, in, or interest. And we're not talking here about representation as in elected representation. We're talking about community leaders, community representatives, third sector um, spokespeople who are expected to speak on behalf of... We, do, we have built a democracy of intermediaries. Um, it's not just in Scotland, it's happening everywhere, but it's also under strong scrutiny and criticism. Because a lot of people do not see themselves represented by those who are supposed to be representing them. And again, that's beyond the sort of um, elected members or even community councils. Um, and what we found um, is that being a community representative puts a lot of pressure on, on citizens, particularly when they don't have a democratic mandate and yet they are expected to speak on behalf of a particular group or a particular place. Um, <laughs> accountability is a massive issue. Um, issues to do with how then uh, those representatives who occupy spaces in various partnerships and forums and processes, how they keep a link to their community is very problematic. We find um, that generally there is a lot of skepticism in the literature around how good this uh, reliance on intermediaries and representatives actually is. And to me, that brings us to a key issue, which is about the contrast between representatives and delegates. In, in, in a more participatory democracy, I think we'll have more delegates. The difference between a delegate and a representative is that a delegate needs to be much more attached to their community. It needs to have a clear, ongoing conversation with that particular community of place, practice, or, or interest, so that then it's truly reflective, rather than just being someone who, because she occupies a particular position in the community or is part of a particular community group, is expected to understand the variety of perspectives in that particular community. Um, so I think there is a, a great role to think about the role of delegation uh, over representation. Um, on, digital, on the digital side of things, we didn't find anything particularly surprising. It's crucial, it is crucial, we do need to make sure that our democracy um, makes uh, the best of the new opportunities. Um, but it's also true that what is out there tends to be a use of digital to do the kind of stuff we used to do before, rather than to do new things. So we, have, we, we don't have a lot of the exciting sort of crowdsourcing that we see in places like Reykjavik or Barcelona. We don't have a lot of the using some of the new platforms. We have a lot of using new social media to do the kind of thing we have always done with our 
for PR purposes or bilateral conversations or uh, so there is um, an area for growth in terms of platforms that allow more sophisticated forms of dialogue and deliberation. Um, and then another thing that Ruth explores is the uh, issue of um, funding and um, bureaucracy. And um, the, the way she puts it uh, is that bureaucratic burdens generate unnecessary levels of anxiety and complexity for community groups. And some people are better, better equipped at navigating funding processes and so on. So that's a, quite a massive uh, barrier still reflected in the literature. So let me speed up a little bit. Um, so I'm getting carried away. I thought it was going to be shorter. Um, in terms of what works, um, I, I'm not going to stop a lot here because there's a lot of common sense stuff that, for the detail, again, I invite you to go to the, to the report. Um, but the um, no one size fits all, which we have been saying for years now, or remains um, clear in the literature. Uh, sometimes you do need to do a little bit of research before you develop an engagement process and understand what's the best way. So, and I know it's a little bit cumbersome, so involve your community in deciding how they want to be involved. <laughs> but, but, there are ways of doing it that um, perhaps can, um, you know, drawn on research uh, approaches that can help you to develop a process that truly responds to the needs and priorities of the community you are working with. Uh, and then we do need to get better at cataloging practice. Good and bad. Actually, I would encourage, uh, uh, you know, I'm a great believer in bad practice. That's what we really, really learn. Not in fostering bad practice, but in recording uh, when uh, things don't go according to plan, which is the world of most engagement practitioners. It's a, it's a, a, a life of pleasures and pressures of various kinds, uh, trying to do your best and always uh, falling short of the ideal. Um, so, and there are a number of really exciting platforms out there. In particular, Participedia, if you haven't come across it, it's a crowdsourced Wikipedia of um, participation stuff. So, for participatory nerds, such as some of you in the room. Uh, so, check out Participedia, lots of cases. And you can add your own cases there, and it's good that we share these things. Um, then, the support, and, and this, is, this is a key element because, um, you know, sometimes, I think, there's, there's a really vibrant uh, civil society in Scotland, and volunteering, actually just under half percent of the Scottish population volunteers in, in some form or shape. Um, uh, and, and that's fine, and volunteering is a, is a way of giving to your society. But when it comes to engagement processes that try to involve people in decision-making processes or in making policies or in deciding services, we need to think beyond volunteering, and we need to find ways of lowering the barriers to participation. Because otherwise, there is something called the self-selection bias, which means that in the end, only a self-selected minority ends up participating in those processes. And it has to do with the level of education, income, and so on. So unless some of those barriers are lowered, um, um, it can be uh, quite difficult to make sure that people can participate. There are some uh, sort of cutting edge ideas out there in the literature. Some of you might have heard about the universal basic income, which some people are saying could be not just a contribution to the way we do capitalism, but also a contribution to the way we do democracy. So there are some interesting things being piloted and considered. Um, the, the forging of new partnerships based on a, a better model of leadership than what we usually have. Um, a, a model of leadership that distributes power across different players and rotates power frequently enough so that no one is put on a pedestal for too long. Um, and that kind of facilitative leadership that is more about bringing people together and getting things done rather than knowing all the answers and taking people in your direction. Um, Transparency, I touched on that earlier, the transparency between the expectations and, and the outcomes, and the development of community support services. So one of the things sometimes we forget, and, and one of the things that sometimes is difficult to watch, is that while the community empowerment agenda is advancing quite strongly in Scotland, at the very same time there have been lots of CLD, community learning and development departments, that have been shut. So what's, what's, what's going on? So we're losing the workforce and we're expecting to do more of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Problematic. Uh, participatory budgeting, a big thing going on in Scotland. Uh, sometimes we forget that in the places where it worked well, um, uh, like in Curitiba or Belo Horizonte in Brazil, this, these were places where local councils invested in a massive workforce of community organizers to go out there and make these things happen. So, um, 
I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, some of these things you will be familiar with. The use of um, clear and supportive communication, communication. The key role of facilitators, especially when we're thinking about that internal inclusion that I mentioned earlier, what happens once we are in the room. Um, and facilitation is a skilled practice that takes a long time um, and, and that often we underestimate. And that's why we end up having meetings where there are a lot of rituals uh, rather than meaningful conversations. Um, there is also, um, it's important that we begin to realize that it's not enough just to involve one particular group that might be more directly affected. Mm. If we're talking about public services, policies, <coughs> um, and programs that affect a range of people, we really need to involve a cross-section of the relevant population. We cannot just go to those who um, are more easily accessible or claim to speak on behalf of others without having a clear mandate. Um, technology, I mentioned it earlier, and then, and although we appreciate that the last thing we need is more monitoring and forms and so on. The, the report, and the report, and this is a conversation that Ruth and I had for some time, um, it, we do recommend that we do need to monitor better. And this is tricky, but we need to get better at knowing who is taking part, because otherwise we're not going to know if we're making progress. And I don't know if that's getting better at monitoring. I don't know if that's about a particular form. There might be more creative ways of doing that, but we need to find a way of documenting what's going on. So let me conclude just with two um, sort of slides to recap a couple of things. Um, I think, you know, sometimes when we think about inclusion and diversity, we're thinking about the obvious stuff, the demographic um, inclusion and the sort of the making sure that people are invited or a space is open enough that people will come in. But actually, there are more dimensions to these two things. With inclusion and exclusion, as I said earlier, there is external inclusion, getting access into the process, and then there is internal inclusion. And that's about having an influence during the process. And that depends on good facilitation, good process design, making sure that there are several ways of influencing a process. When we facilitate citizens' juries, for instance, or citizens' assemblies, we often tend to build anywhere between four and eight ways of influencing the outcome that don't depend on talking. Because if it only depends on talking, then you're giving an advantage to those who know how to play that game. So you need different ways of influencing the process that don't rely on one single mechanism. Uh, and then diversity. Very often we think about the usual, the, the backgrounds, the, what we would call in the jargon the demographic diversity. But just as important is what, what we call discursive diversity, the diversity of perspectives. Because you can have 100 people in the room, but if they all think the same, that's arguably less diverse than 10 people who think very differently. So from a democratic perspective, it's not a numbers game. It's a diversity of perspectives game. And then uh, the diversity of knowledge, expertise, experience, and so on. So um, I, I want to conclude with what I think is one of the areas that really needs uh, further research. And it's something that we might consider, or I consider one of the key paradoxes in this field, which is the what I would call the, pu the public engagement paradox. In the last five decades or so, there's ever growing opportunities to participate, engagement opportunities, opportunities to be consulted, and yet there are ever growing inequalities. In theory, if there's more participation and engagement, in theory, outcomes should be more distributed um, in, in, in more desirable and equitable ways. But that's not what we have seen as a society. And that's often because we've focused a lot on engagement processes without focusing on the broader of structural inequalities issues. And, and my proposition, and I'm hoping that we will get to test this in some way, I'm not quite sure how, but, um, is that perhaps inequalities in health, um, income, wealth, education, and so on, stem from inequalities of power and influence. And what I mean by that, and these are the kind of things that we can look into, I mean, how to explain that paradox? It might well be that we do have engagement processes that are not inclusive, it's only a self-selected uh, minority of the population that gets to influence the agenda, and therefore, only their priorities get reflected, and only that shapes policies and public services. It might also well be that actually there are engagement processes that are genuinely inclusive. It just happens that they are not properly connected to the final decisions. So, uh, this is how the things that hopefully we need to look into. Um, I'm going to leave it there, and thank you for your patience.